بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام م ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم واسمعوا وأطيعوا وأنفقوا خيرا لأنفسكم ومن يوقى شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم if you were to ask many people today and in the past what they're looking for in life, they would respond perhaps by saying success. And the notion of seeking success is uh, universally found within the thinking and the mindset of many human beings, of course. The Holy Quran in 12 occasions refers to the successful ones, al-mufliḥūn, and gives us guidelines on how to achieve that desirable uh, state of achieving happiness, prosperity, and success. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after describing the muttaqeen, says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ ال- here in chapter 64, Surah Al-Taghabun, ayah number 16, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us from his uh, blessings and mercy another important direction on how to attain this falah in Arabic known as success. And this is uh, related, or this verse is related to the all-important concept that is discussed in Islamic ethics with the uh, title of generosity and miserliness or stinginess. The religion of Islam, of course, is uh, a set of instructions that clearly wants the well-being of society in general. So it's not an individualistic um, teaching, so to speak. It uh, encourages people to build on community cohesion, thinking about others, to break the tendency of being self-centered, egoistic in thinking, and therefore uh, espouses this notion of building good relationships with others, helping and supporting others in the community and in society by and large. And one of the ways in which we can do this is through the practice of generosity, uh, known in Arabic as as-sakha or al-karam. These are terms, or as well as al-jud. These are terms that are synonymously sometimes used to denote generosity. The Holy Quran in many uh, areas encourages the believers to display and exhibit generous behavior throughout their lives. And indeed, the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt point to the excellence of being a generous individual. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, in a beautiful hadith which is found in Bihar al-Anwar in volume 8, says, as of Bihar al-Anwar, volume 73 rather for this, as qareebun min Allah, qareebun min al-Nas, qareebun min al-Jannah, the generous is close to God, close to people, close to Jannah, but far from Jahannam. وَالْبَخِيلُ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ الْجَنَّةِ قَرِيبٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ The stingy, miserly person is far from God, is far from people, is far from Jannah, but is close to hell. Very beautifully uh, put together by the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. And of course, yes, 
they are close to Allah because it's a noble, virtuous characteristic. They're close to Jannah because they will attain this because of their hard work. But also, people like generous individuals. They, they praise people who are generous and are not, so to speak, tight with their wealth or belongings or whatever it is, but are open and, and supportive uh, and wish to give as much as they can. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, this time in Al Bihar, volume 8, uh, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, says, Now he describes this generosity, Sakha, as a tree. And this tree has its branches in dunya. Whomsoever practices generosity in dunya will hold on to some of the branches of this tree from Jannah. And that will lead them towards prosperity, paradise. So it is something that's depicted to be from paradise. It's a characteristic of the people of paradise. Indeed, generosity. Now, there are these terms that are often used in uh, describing uh, generous behavior and stingy behavior. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, Holy Progeny, says, arba'ah, that people are of four kinds. Sakhiyun, wa karimun, wa bakhilun, wa laim. These are important terms to know in Arabic. Sakhi, he says, alladhi ya'kul wa yu'ati. The generous one, Sakhi, is the one who themselves they eat, but they also give. والكريم لا يأكل ويعطي. The Kareem, the magnanimous, is the one who they themselves do not eat, but they give. It's a higher level. والبخيل يأكل ولا يعطي. The Bakhil, the stingy, is the one who eats but does not give. واللئيم لا يأكل ولا يعطي. This Laeem, which is worse than Bakhil, is they do not eat and they do not give. You see that level of stinginess that they themselves even, you know, are so protective of their wealth that they're keen for it not to reduce, so to speak, you know. And on this note, it's fascinating that Amir al muminin peace and blessings be upon him, in Al-Bihar, volume 72, in a beautiful narration, says, Ajibtu lishaqi al-bakhil. He says, I'm surprised about the wretched miserly person. They are running away. They don't want to be in a state of poverty. Yes, they claim that they are saving money and don't want to, for example, help others or support others because they say, I want to save it for a rainy day. I don't want to be poor one day. Maybe I'll need it one day. You know, that's their... Uh, uh, mentality or the, the, the way they convince themselves, yes? In this process, the state of being wealthy that he is looking for, he does not attain to. Because he doesn't consider himself wealthy because he's constantly watching how much he's spending, he or she, yes? So Imam says they're trying to stay away from poverty and they are themselves in poverty. And they are looking to be in a state of wealth, but he's far away from being wealthy. Then he says, In this dunya, he's going to live as a poor person. And on the day of judgment, he'll be held accountable as a rich person. Can you see? He, didn't, he wanted to avoid poverty, but he's going through poverty, in a sense, because he's very careful what to spend about anything. He wanted to be wealthy, but he's not wealthy, yes? Because he is not enjoying his wealth. In dunya, he lives as a poor person. In akhirah, he's held accountable as a wealthy person, because he had the money. Yeah, so Imam Ali Salam describes this. And of course, the Ahl al-Bayt Ali Salam are wonderful examples of the highest levels of generosity and the epitome of karam 
uh, the uh, glorious Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. And so many examples can be given from the Quran, such as the famous story of uh, the uh, giving of the food for three consecutive days, as well as other examples found in the Quran. One particular interesting story that's found in Hadith is with regards to the story of a man who was the son of an individual who people used to use as an example of generosity. Hatam al Ta'i. If you ever come across this man's name, he died before uh, you know, the Prophet declared the message of Islam, perhaps. And uh, the Prophet later says, if he was a Muslim, I would have prayed for him. Yes. Um, and other, some narrations say because of his generosity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whilst he's being punished uh, for his uh, idolatry, created some kind of a protection in Jahannam from the heat because of that. Anyway, he was very well known for his generosity. Whatever he used to have, for example, he would have uh, guests coming in. He would have one, example, one goat or one calf. He would slaughter it. Not thinking about, oh, but there's only that that's left. What am I going to feed? Straight away. Yeah? His son, Adi ibn Hatam al Ta'i, initially was fighting the Holy Prophet. He was advocating against the Prophet. So, in a battle, his sister, this Adi sister, the daughter of the Hatam, by the name of Sunana, is arrested or is captured, is taken as a slave, brought to the Holy Prophet. And she identifies herself. She says, I am the daughter of Hatam al Ta'i. You know, the great Hatam of the man who's uh, uh, known for his generosity and pleads with the Prophet. The Prophet of Islam not only frees her, but also uh, looks after her, gives her whatever she needs, and she's very happy. She returns back to uh, her brother and she says to him the following She says, Ra'aytu, I saw a man who loves the poor people and uh, frees the uh, captives and has compassion over the young and has respect for the old. I have not seen a person who is more generous than this man. The daughter of the man who is known to be the most generous in Arabia says, I have not seen a person who is more generous than the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny. Adi ibn Hatim, his, the, the, her brother, was so inspired by this description. I mean, this is a house of generosity, so to speak. They, were, they, they grew up, their father giving everything, goes to Medina, sees the Prophet, embraces the religion of Islam. His sister embraces the religion of Islam. And later, Adi ibn Hatim becomes a companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam. But it's all due to this description of the uh, excellent qualities of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. As an example, we know Imam Al Hassan Al Mujtaba was known as Karim Ahl Al Bayt. A poor man would come to him and he would give him half of his wealth. Half of his wealth. Sometimes it is mentioned that he gave him his entire wealth. He would sit with the poor and the needy and, and take them and feed them. And we are told that, for example, and all the Ahl Al Bayt, with no exception whatsoever, where the crystallization of these beautiful values that the Quran speaks about, especially generosity. Yeah? Uh, we are told that one person would proclaim in Medina, we knew the meaning of sadaqatu sir, giving charity privately at night. We knew its value, its understanding, when we heard that Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin had been martyred. That's when we knew that it had kind of stopped. That's when we knew he was a man who would be walking at the night, carrying these sackful of goods and food and so on, giving it to the poor and the needy. Um, on the other side, of course, what the vice is, is being stingy and miserly. And, uh, Narrations highlight the, the danger of this and the fact that human beings should work on themselves to resist 
that temptation from the shaitan to hold back when they have an opportunity to help and support. In fact, in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 78, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, النظر إلى البخيل يقسي القلب Not only is being miserly a problem, but looking at a miser hardens the heart. It's a cause for the darkening of the heart. And as much as the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as wear the manifestation of the verses on the Qur'an which explain and support and encourage generosity, their enemies were also examples of stinginess. Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, a well-known Abbasid Caliph, he is today known to be one of the stingiest Caliphs man who was truly bakhil and many examples are given about his life we are told that one day he uh, wanted a special door built from his palace onto the mosque so he got a person to build him this door it took a while and the construction and uh, he gives him two dirhams just two dirhams and says take it for the whole work that he did two dirhams and it's not even dinar, so they're not gold coins, silver coins. Once his life was in danger, he was um, going through a particularly um, vicious ailment or uh, condition, and a doctor came and treated him, and he was somehow saved. The, uh, this caliph, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, gives the doctor a piece of bread as a reward for saving his life. So this doctor he was in shock and disbelief. So he picked up this piece of bread and wrapped it around his neck, just like that, and started walking in the marketplaces. So people started thinking, why is this doctor well known wrapped a, a piece of bread around his neck? So they kept asking him and he kept saying, this is my reward from the caliph for saving his life. So then when the caliph heard, he summoned him. You would think that when he summons him, he says, you know what, don't embarrass me in front of everyone, here's some money. He t says, give me this loaf. He takes three quarters of it and says, you don't deserve the whole loaf. He gives him a quarter of it back. To that extent of uh, bukhul and stinginess. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we have this in different shapes and forms. It kind of makes our way. I remember reading that... Uh, once there was a person who was dying, you know, uh, in his deathbed, uh, suffering from the last moments in his life, and they had two of the uh, friends, they were not relatives, who were sitting next to him. So they thought he had gone unconscious, so they began talking about the funeral. What should they do when it comes to this person dying? So the first person said, I think we'll get a car, and, uh, you know, we'll transport the body to the cemetery using the car, you know, special car that carries the bodies. Second person said, oh, that's too expensive. I think we get a few people and we carry the body. We don't really want to spend money for, on a car. And then whilst they were discussing and debating this, this poor man was about to die, wakes up and says, I've decided to walk to my grave. <laughs> you know, to that extent, to say to them, look, you know, what are you talking about? To that level, it is mentioned that once a husband and a wife were eating were presented uh, you know wife had cooked some food presented it to the husband the husband looked and said how delicious this food would have been if it wasn't for so many people here the wife says but there's only me and you there's not many there's no one else here he says yes but it would be more delicious if it was just me and the plate yes as if like you know th that's the extent to that sometimes people would be going towards when thinking about this uh, fear of, uh, uh, of, of uh, poverty, so to speak. Um, this verse talks about an extreme or another level of bukhul, which is known as shuh. وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ Now what is shuh? We are told from a narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, الشَّحِيحُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْبَخِيلِ a person who practices shuh is worse than bukhul, worse than stingy, a person who's stingy. Why? يَشُحُّ عَلَى مَا فِي أَيْدِ النَّاسِ 
this person, when they see that somebody has something, not only do they hold back with what they have, not only do they not give from what they have, but when they see someone having something that they do not have, حَتَّى لَا يَرَى فِي أَيْدِ النَّاسِ شَيْئًا إِلَّا تَمَنَّى أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ بِالْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ When they see someone having something, they wish to have that from them in whichever means, halal or haram. So not only are they withholding, but they want whatever others have, even illegitimately. That's what the Quran here denounces and says, you have that tendency. Human beings have that tendency. وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ The nafs has that willingness to think in that way. Not only would it go down the road of being miserly, but at the same time wishing to, to remove the blessing and whatever somebody else has in whichever way, shape and form. That's why we are told that at the time of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny, once he said to the companions that there's that man is a person from the people of Jannah. And by the way, this is a very interesting point, just in between brackets, because unfortunately some of our brothers on the Sunnah, they look at these verses that says, for example, Allah forgives them, or Allah is happy with them, and they are happy with Allah, when talking about the uh, specific incidents uh, at the time of the Holy Prophet with some of the Sahaba. This, when the Prophet says that this person is from the people of Jannah, doesn't mean that they are guaranteed Jannah and whatever they do, they do, and they go to Jannah anyway. It means if they die in this state, they're in Jannah. That's the key. It's not about, oh, well, you know what, I'm already in Jannah, so let me do what the Prophet said, I'm in Jannah. Likewise, the verses in the Quran that says Allah is pleased with them, Allah is pleased with them now for this action, but if they die now with this action, yes, they die in this state. But later on, if they commit crimes, if they violate, if they oppress, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, they have to be held accountable for it, isn't it? So somebody says, I wanted to see why is this man one of the people of Jannah? So I went to him, I said, excuse me, would you allow me to live with you for three days? No problem. I stayed with him for three days. Normal, he prays, he goes to do work, he helps here and there. So I didn't see anything abnormal about his life. So I was wondering, what is it that he does that he is from the people of paradise? And eventually, after three days, I asked him, is there anything that you can tell me about you? Is there any features? Have you trained yourself to do something that maybe is praiseworthy? Not particularly. This is one thing that I emphasize upon myself is that every time I see something that others have that I don't, I pray to Allah, I say, oh Allah, give that person more. Increase the blessings and the favors upon them and the rizq. Give them more, yes? So it seems that that in itself was such an important quality that qualified that this person to be if they continued from the people of Jannah according to their narration. Therefore, the Quran says, be careful, save your own selves from that type of thinking and that tendency and instead inculcate the spirit of generosity within one's actions, which certainly leads to more love spreading in the society. It's certainly, according to Riwayat, a generous individual is bestowed by the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with more rizq. So people think that by giving for the sake of Allah, it's actually less. Uh, their, their, their wealth is less or they are losing, whereas Islamic teachings say no, they are gaining. Not only in Akhirah will they be obtaining a lot of reward, but uh, they are in fact possibly increasing their rizq according to the narration. We are told that when you give something to someone or help them or assist the poor and the needy or 
in whichever shape or form, you should thank them. You might ask why. You know, yes, you are saving their dunya, but they're saving your akhirah. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because it is a mean, means to not only obtain blessings in this world, but certainly reward um, uh, in the hereafter. Amir al-Mu'mini, peace be upon him, uh, says, Alaykum bil sakha'i wa husn al Be generous and develop good manners. فَإِنَّهُمَا يَزِيدَانِ الرِّزْقِ It will increase the rizq. وَيُوجِبَانِ الْمَحَبَّةِ and it will inculcate and spread love amongst the people, amongst as well many other features, uh, strengthening the community as well uh, that we see today. For example, within our own community, we have people who want to go to Hajj and don't have the means. Yes, it's not wajib, um, but sometimes to support them is quite noble. So, uh, we have people who want to get married and God help those who want to get married these days with the high costs that are involved, sadly, uh, with the, you know, the different uh, uh, expectations, starting from the wedding card, which is about 10 pounds a piece or something like that, all the way until everything else that's been uh, out there, the trend this day and age, which is not recommended. But having said that, there are people out there that would be very appreciative of support and assistance and uh, certainly to display and exhibit that brings the happiness of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course his reward and his mercy. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahum ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.